Have you been puzzled by standing wave ratio or SWR? Ask Dave episode 28 provides surprising answers. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG with Ask Dave episode 28. Antennas are of intense interest. They are, after all, our connection with the rest of the world. There are many measures of antenna performance, including gain, radiation pattern, efficiency, and on and on. One of the least important of these measures is SWR, which simply describes how much of the power offered to the antenna is reflected back to the source. It says nothing about how well the antenna radiates. In fact, a dummy load, which doesn't radiate at all, has an excellent SWR. But of all antenna parameters, SWR is by far the most easily measured, and therefore one of intense concern for those new to ham radio. This somewhat longer than usual video explores SWR. We'll define it and see how it really behaves. The answers may amaze you. SWR has to do with the transmission of electromagnetic energy, in other words, radio waves. I am assuming throughout that the transceiver has a 50 ohm output and that your transmission line is good quality 50 ohm line. I'm also using a half wave dipole as the antenna with wire of ordinary thickness such as 12 to 18 gauge which is much like common household electrical wire. We will focus entirely on the connection between the transmission line and the antenna. This is the point of impedance mismatch. The incident or forward wave is traveling from your transceiver toward the antenna. It hits the impedance mismatch where the 50 ohm transmission line meets the antenna input. If the antenna presents a 50 ohm purely resistive impedance, there will be no reflection. However, as we'll discover, that's rarely the case, so some of the power, shown in blue, will be reflected back toward the transmitter. The Greek letter rho, and yes, it looks like a p, but it's really the Greek equivalent of a lowercase r, is the coefficient of reflection. Everything here is done in voltage. That's an important point to remember. So if the forward wave is 10 volts and the reflected wave is 2 volts, the magnitude of the reflection coefficient is 2 divided by 10, or 0.2. Rho is a complex number with the phase angle representing the phase of the reflected signal relative to the incident signal. But we don't need to know the phase angle to calculate SWR, so we just use the magnitude of rho, shown here as the absolute value, which is equivalent to the magnitude. Now, the SWR can be figured by the formula shown in pink, which we'll talk about more later. In passing, I show a general model of an antenna so you can see how this works. The antenna has two types of resistance, radiation resistance and ohmic resistance. The radiation resistance acts like any resistance, except instead of creating heat, it creates RF energy that propagates away from the antenna. The ohmic resistance is that portion of the antenna resistance that actually results in heat. But note that antennas also contain reactive elements, so the total antenna impedance can contain both resistive and reactive components. That's enough on antennas for the moment. This animated drawing from Wikipedia shows the classic explanation of a standing wave. This case, which in practice would mean a completely broken antenna system, has a reflection coefficient of 1, meaning all the power is reflected, leaving none to be radiated. The forward wave is in blue, and you can see the arrow following the crest of the blue wave from the transmitter toward the antenna. The reflected wave is in red, and you can follow the arrow to see it head back toward the transmitter. 
Now, the black wave is the instantaneous sum of the two waves. It looks like a wave just standing there. It isn't going anywhere, so the sum of the power transfer is zero. Okay, let's look in the bottom box. By definition, the standing wave ratio, or SWR, is the ratio of the peak voltage of the combined waveform divided by the combined waveform's minimum voltage. Note that the peak value of the combined waveform is two volts, and the minimum is zero volts peak for a ratio of infinity. This figure therefore represents the worst case when zero power makes it past the impedance mismatch to be radiated. I emphasize again, this is not what happens in actual practice. I created this animation to show a much more common scenario. The dark blue waveform is the forward or incident voltage waveform going from the transmitter on the left to the antenna on the right as shown by the red arrow that follows along. Its peak value is 1 volt. The red wave is the voltage of the reflected wave traveling from the antenna input back toward the transmitter as shown by the red arrow. The value is one half that of the incident wave, or a half volt in this case. Thus the reflection coefficient is 0.5 or one half. The cyan or light blue waveform is the instantaneous sum of the incident and reflected waveforms. Let's study this. Note that since actual power is being transferred, the sum wave isn't actually standing anymore, but we still call it that. The sum waveform's highest peak is 1.5 volts, but its lowest peak value is at 0.5 volts. From this we can compute the SWR directly as the ratio of 1.5 to 0.5, or 3. By the way, we can compute this from the reflection coefficient also. Rho is 0.5, so SWR by formula is 1 plus 0.5 divided by 1 minus 0.5 for an answer of 3, or 3 to 1. Now let's just look at one more thing here. SWR is voltage. The term voltage SWR, or VSWR, often pronounced VSWR, is synonymous with SWR. But let's look at this in watts. A 1 volt waveform on a 50 ohm line represents a forward power of just 0.02 watts, and the reflected voltage of 1 half volt represents a power of 0.005 watts. Thus, the percentage of the power reflected back is 25%. So note the difference in terms of dealing in voltage with 50% reflected back and dealing in power with 25% reflected back. Let's take a closer look at that antenna model. The total impedance is the two resistances added to the two reactances. Now, we're going to jump into the deep end for a bit here. This is stuff covered in the amateur extra material, but in short, adding resistances to reactances is not straightforward. The J here indicates the reactance axis, which is perpendicular to the resistance axis. The value of the reactance of an inductor or capacitor is usually noted by the letter X. The two formulas are shown one for X sub L for inductive reactance and X sub C for capacitive reactance, and it is very important to note that the reactance varies with frequency. Note in the formula at the top that the capacitive reactance subtracts from the inductive reactance. So it is possible that if the magnitude of X sub L equals the magnitude of X sub C, that the two can cancel, leaving an entirely resistive antenna. There is a single frequency at which this occurs, and this is called the resonant frequency. Note that, resonance occurs on a single frequency, 
not on an entire band or subband, but on a single frequency. We can determine the frequency by solving for the frequency at which the inductive reactance equals the capacitive reactance, and after a little algebra, come up with the formula that the resonant frequency is 1 divided by 2 pi times the square root of the inductance in henrys times the capacitance in farads. Again, note that if you have an antenna that is resonant at a frequency f, and you use it for a frequency less than this, the antenna will act as though it has not only resistance, but also some capacitive inductance and vice versa. Let's look at an example. We are looking strictly at the reactive component here. We've cut our antenna for resonance at 7.118 megahertz in the middle of the 40 meter band. You can see that at this frequency, the total reactive component is zero. But note that if you move away from the resonant frequency, you rapidly pick up a reactive component. Why is this important anyway? Well, a reactive component cannot dissipate energy, but must give it back up and send it back to the transmitter. In other words, it affects the SWR. In this case, at 7 MHz, the antenna has a minus 75 ohm reactance to add to the presumably 50 ohm resistive component. And if you go the other way, at 7.3 MHz, the reactance is close to a positive 125 ohms. Wow! The reactive component can be huge. But note that this is not all cut and dried. Here we change the values of capacitance and inductance such that the resonant frequency is still the same. But note that the reactance added as you go up and down the band is not nearly as much as the last chart. Can we do even better? The answer is yes. By increasing the capacitance and reducing the inductance, note that the reactance values are smaller across the band. Antenna designers pay attention to this sort of stuff. It is impossible to completely eliminate reactive effects, but they don't have to be quite so huge. So, we can summarize by pointing out that unless you are transmitting exactly at the point of resonance on your antenna, you will have a reactive component. When you transmit at frequencies below resonance, the antenna has capacitive reactance, and above this has inductive reactance. It's just physics. Okay, let's look at an electrical half-wave dipole in free space, which is pretty much the equivalent of the dipole being in the air by more than a couple wavelengths. The dipole is cut based on half an electrical wavelength. Given that the velocity factor of a radio wave and wire is about 0.95, an electrical half wavelength is given by a familiar looking formula in which the length in feet is given by 468 divided by the frequency in megahertz. But now for the weirdness. Such a dipole in free space is reactive. And note the resistive component. If we connect this dipole to our familiar 50 ohm transmission line, we will certainly have a mismatch and thus an SWR greater than 1. And the antenna is inductive, meaning it's actually a titch too long for true resonance. Again, this is a theoretical dipole. Let's look at this graph from Wikipedia. The charge is in fractions of a wavelength with respect to a full wavelength. So it is important to keep in mind that this chart assumes the use of a constant frequency, such as one in the middle of the 40 meter band. Let's take a look at the chart in some detail. The impedance of the antenna is shown on the vertical axis. Real resistance is always positive and is shown by the black line. Note that at half wavelength, the resistance is under 100 ohms. At one wavelength, the resistance is so high as to be off the chart. At 1.5 wavelengths, there is a region where the resistance again comes down to reasonable levels. Now, let's look at the blue line representing reactants.
Where the blue line is below the middle zero, that's capacitive reactance, and above is inductive reactance. Note that where the blue line crosses the zero line, reactance is zero and the antenna is resonant. So antennas that are about a half wavelength are near resonance. We have another resonant point at a full wavelength, although as previously noted, the feed point impedance is out of sight off the top of the chart. This is why full wavelength dipoles are seldom useful. The next resonant point is in the region of 1.5 wavelengths, and the resistance is manageable. An example here might be using an antenna cut for half-wave resonance on 7 MHz, and then using it on 21 MHz. At 21 MHz, an antenna cut for one half wavelength on 7 MHz is seen as a three-halves wavelength antenna on 21 MHz and can be resonant. Does this mean that if you cut a dipole for 40 meters, you can also use it for 15 meters? The answer is yes. Okay, we're going to look at this chart in considerably more detail. I've drawn a line here to show more precisely where the half wavelength line crosses the curves. You'll note that the reactance is a bit inductive. Now, I've added two horizontal lines, one where the half wavelength line crosses the resistance curve and one where it crosses the reactance curve. It's a little messy, so let's move in for a close-up. Okay, here's a close-up. Here's the half wave line. It crosses the resistance line at about 73 ohms and the reactance line at 42.5 ohms, give or take of course, but this is entirely consistent with the impedance of the free space half wave dipole. Now, we can ask a question. How does a dipole behave if it is used at a frequency just a bit different from the design frequency? The curves are highly nonlinear. But in the nearby region, we can treat them as linear. Okay, back to high school algebra. We draw a line tangent to the resistance line at a half wavelength. Near a half wavelength, the intercept is 72 ohms plus a slope of 430 ohms for every change in wavelength. The equation shown is only valid for wavelengths quite close to the half wavelength point. Now, let's do the same for the reactance. We come up with an intercept of 42.5 ohms and 2,212 ohms for every lambda deviation from a half wavelength. Again, the formula is only valid for small deviations from one half lambda, where lambda is the Greek letter for wavelength. Now, let's arm ourselves with just one more item before jumping into examples drawn from the formulas we just derived. This shows the effect on the feed point impedance of height above a perfect ground. No ground is perfect, of course, so these numbers will change significantly at your location. Most hams can't get dipoles up beyond a half wavelength in the air. For example, a 40 meter dipole would need to be 20 meters or 66 feet in the air to be at a half wavelength above the ground. As the dipole is mounted closer to ground, the feed point impedance changes dramatically. Somewhere just shy of a quarter wavelength in the air, the impedance, here meaning the resistive component of the impedance, is 50 ohms. The table shows the height above ground for 50 ohm input impedance, and the heights aren't too bad for 40 meters and above. But impedance keeps dropping as we lower the antenna. Okay, now, armed with all this information, let's look at some specific cases encountered in common amateur use. Here's the free space dipole case. The antenna is cut for an electrical half wavelength at 7.15 MHz in the middle of the 40 meter band. The graph shows the SWR across the 40 meter band. We would like the SWR to be below 2 to 1 across the part of the band in which we want to operate. If it's below 2 to 1, you can simply connect your antenna and go.
If it's below three to one, many modern rigs have built-in antenna tuners that will touch this up for operation, but they won't handle anything above three to one, so keep that in mind. In this case, the antenna, an electrical half wavelength raised to more than a wavelength in the air, goes below an SWR of 2 to 1 at 7.125 MHz. Note that in this circumstance, we can never hit 1 to 1 SWR because the resistive part of the feed point impedance is not equal to 50 ohms. Okay, in this chart, I've made the antenna a little shorter for a half electrical wavelength cut for 7.3 megahertz. Now, note that it has 2 to 1 SWR from 7.025 through 7.260 megahertz and less than 3 to 1 SWR across the entire band. Note that at no point is the SWR 1 to 1. This is normal. But most hams can't get their dipoles a full wavelength in the air, so let's lower it to about a quarter wavelength above the ground, where our chart showed us that resistance was about 50 ohms. For a 40 meter antenna, that's 10 meters or about 30 feet in the air. This is often achievable. Let's leave the reactants alone. Here's the resulting SWR curve with 50 ohms resistive. Its 2 to 1 SWR bandwidth stretches from 7.060 MHz to about 7.280 MHz, and the 3 to 1 bandwidth covers the entire band. This is a most satisfactory situation, even though the antenna remains quite reactive, except right at the bottom of the dip. So, Let's lengthen our antenna to an electrical half wave in the middle of the band and rejigger the antenna for less reactance. Here's what we get, still with a bit of reactance at the half wavelength. This is a very nice antenna. At its resonant frequency, there is an SWR of 1 to 1. But note that with changes in frequency, reactive components re-enter the situation and the SWR rises on either side of it. The SWR is not less than 2 to 1 across the entire band, but it is less than 3 to 1. But now look at the effect of lowering the antenna. The feed point resistance drops, in this case to 40 ohms, still with reactants. Note that you now cannot get a 1 to 1 SWR because the feed point resistance is other than 50 ohms. And now our 2 to 1 bandwidth drops. Moral of the story? Get your antenna up higher in the air if you can. Here's an antenna that's even lower. Now our 2 to 1 bandwidth is yet smaller and the 3 to 1 bandwidth doesn't cross the entire band. You'll need a heftier tuner. But and this is important. If you can just get the antenna a little more in the air, that feed point resistance will rise and help you with the SWR problem. In some cases, you have no way to get it higher, so you will have to use a wide range tuner. One more thing. So far, we've looked at 7 MHz and find that we can cover the entire band with a single dipole at less than 3 to 1 SWR. That is not true of 80 meters. I've put the feed point resistance at 30 ohms to reflect that it's really hard to get an 80 meter dipole very high in the air, which would be 60 feet just for a quarter wavelength. Note that the 2 to 1 SWR bandwidth is very narrow. If you use a dipole on 80 meters, you'll need to cut it for the part of the band in which you operate because one dipole can't cover the entire band. I just want to cover one additional side note. If you have a long, lossy cable run, your SWR between the transmitter and the feed line, which is where we usually measure it, will show an SWR much lower or more optimistic than the actual SWR at the antenna feed point. Let's see how that works. We start out with an antenna with a 3 to 1 SWR at its feed point. From the ARRL antenna book, we see that RG8X at 144 megahertz loses 1 dB of signal for every 27 feet. 
Let's pick a realistic 81-foot feed line for a loss of 3 dB at 2 meters. We start with 50 watts at the transmitter, which Ohm's law tells us is 50 volts. OK, the feed line has 3 dB loss, so only 25 watts reaches the antenna. We noted in an earlier slide that for a 3 to 1 SWR, a quarter of the power is reflected back. So of the 25 watts, 6.25 watts is reflected back, leaving 18.75 watts for the antenna to radiate. That means that because of the lossy feed line in the 3 to 1 SWR, we've lost an additional 1.25 dB, so our total loss in the transmission line due to the higher antenna SWR is 4.25 dB. Now, the 6.25 watts of reflected power is cut in half by the 3 dB line loss on its way back to the transmitter. So the transmitter sees only 3.125 watts coming back. At 50 ohms, that equates to 12.5 volts. So rho, our reflection coefficient at the transceiver, is 0.25. Therefore, our SWR at the transceiver is 1.6 to 1. What looks like a nice 1.6 SWR is actually 3 to 1 at the antenna. Bottom line, if SWR at the antenna is greater than 1 to 1, a lossy cable will make SWR appear better than it really is. Let's look at that case on the chart except I've lengthened the cable just a bit to 100 feet. We're using RG8X cable, which is fairly lossy at 2 meters. This chart shows that as the antenna SWR rises, the loss in the cable rises also. Let's look at that same cable, but at 14 megahertz, a more normal place in HF. If the antenna SWR is less than 4 to 1, then the loss in the cable is less than 2 dB, which isn't bad. OK, let's summarize. I made note earlier that SWR is actually one of the less important antenna measurements, but it is easy to measure. We've gone through lots of theory to learn what a realistic SWR looks like graphically, and we've done some actual calculations to look at the impact of the reactive part of antenna impedance. We discovered that on 80 meters, it's impossible to build a dipole that can cover the entire band, but on 40 meters and above, it is possible. We've seen that height matters and that placing the horizontal dipole a quarter wavelength in the air gives generally satisfactory results. We've also learned that a lossy cable may make the SWR look better than it really is. That's quite a bit to think about, isn't it? I hope this has helped illuminate SWR. Under the covers of the various graphs I've shown are some complex mathematics, but I wanted to summarize the effect so I've left out the heavy math. This episode's photo was taken from the summit of Engineer Pass, a little over 20 miles from our home as the crow flies. The shot looks north, and if you look closely, you can see Grand Mesa in the hazy distance. This picture was taken on August 3rd at the peak of the high country wildflower season. Engineer Pass is at 12,800 feet above sea level. I'm sure you can imagine what a great place this would be for an antenna. There's your summary of SWR and how it behaves. I hope this was helpful. I note that with all the heavy math, I may have made some approximations, but the overall lessons learned are a good representation of how real horizontal dipole antennas behave. Very similar things happen with vertical antennas and even multiband antennas. If you liked this video, please share it with your friends. I urge you to subscribe to my channel so that you can get notification of future videos. I have a tip jar on my YouTube channel page and also on my website at ke0og.net. The whole purpose of this series is to answer your questions about ham radio, especially those of interest to those new to the hobby. You can ask questions by commenting on any of my videos on YouTube, preferably on the one most directly related to your question.
or you can pose a question directly at www.ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. Until we next meet, 73.